welcome to the Bible Lab, where we are on a quest to discover the true nature of God. Not what we've been taught growing up, but what does the Bible say about the loving nature of God? Now, before we go too far, we want to make sure that you know that you can go to our website, thebiblelab.com, and get your free copy of the study guide that everyone in the audience is looking at, and you can follow along throughout the conversation. Today, we're going to be looking at the question, does God really forsake people? Your gut reaction is to say, no, God doesn't forsake anyone. It's not in his loving nature. But then you recall the time when Jesus himself said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you say, if he'll forsake his own son, of course, why wouldn't he forsake me? But today you will discover in the Bible lab that Jesus never said that. If you don't believe me, I encourage you to keep watching because you'll see why today on the Bible lab. All right, here we go. Number one, one of the people in this room has really let me down in the past. One of the people in this room has really let me down in the past. All right, I'm looking. I'm looking. It's mostly no's, but there's some yeses. And I saw a maybe over here. You know what a maybe means? It means you're married to the person who has let you down. Not in the past, but probably fairly recently. I'll provide some therapy later. Don't worry about it. We're going to move on. <laughs> if you're the husband, just keep looking straight. You, you don't want to even acknowledge there's, an issue, there's an issue there. Number two, I have had to turn my back on someone because of their behavior. I've had to turn my back on someone because of their behavior. Wow. Look at this. Okay, I'm seeing about 75% yes. About 23% no and about 2% maybes. Wow. You've had to actually turn your back on someone because of their behavior. You're going to love this study. Because this study is all about you treat people in accordance to how you view God. Your picture of God tells you what your picture of you should be like. So as we talk about this, uh, a lot of us are really going to be moved, and a lot of you are going to say, but pastor, you don't understand the situation. And I'm going to say you're absolutely correct. But let's see what God does. Number three, people tend to let me down when I need their help the most. All right. I'm seeing a majority of no. That's probably because many of you don't work on the reception crew. Wasn't the food great today? Yes. It, was, it was mostly pastries. Um, I, I was trying to figure out the theme today. I think the theme was um, based on the teachings of Socrates' cousin, um, carbo, uh, Carbohydrates, I think is <laughs> what his name is. Yeah, that's <laughs> really good. I loved every bit of it. Very cool. Number four, there are times when God forsakes people. There are times when God forsakes people. All right, we are a bit mixed, but it looks like the majority of you, I would say about 95% of you, maybe 93% of you are saying no. And it's kind of a split between the yeses and the maybes for the remainder. What's going through your mind when you're thinking, yeah, God forsakes people? And many of you are saying, yeah, no, God never forsakes people. But I guarantee when we start talking, you're going to be like, Maybe I should have raised the maybe card. <laughs> and last but not least, there is a line you can cross where God the Father will stop trying to save you. We are, once again, a mixed bag. Almost 50-50. It looks like a little bit more no's than yeses. And a few maybes who understand every single one of these questions is a trick question. <laughs> And you cannot stand being wrong. These five statements bring up some of the deepest questions and, quite frankly, the most core concept of why you're here. Many of you are only here in church or part of a Bible study group because of a number one fear that if you stop, God will stop. Right? Right? How many of you grew up with the uh, little children's song? 
Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Crink, crink. <laughs> oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Crink, crink. For the father up above, Rod, he's looking down in love. Zap! <laughs> so be careful, little feet, where you go. Anybody else have nightmares about that song, or is, is that just me? Just me as a kid? Yes, we have this concept. Be careful, because if you step too far outside, you're lost, and you will be forsaken. So as we're coming into this conversation, I want you to look at the study guide. I want you to look at the first question. Let's history gather here together. And I want you to answer this. During your younger years, how fearful were you of your own salvation? And was there a time in which you felt as if God might forsake you? Question and comment cards. I got Sharon over here. We'll start with you, Sharon. I love your red hat today, sweetie. My red hat is to keep the rain off. That's right. <laughs> well, when I was brought up, the, the tone was the do's and the don'ts. Yeah. Which is very different from what we have now. Mm -hmm. Which is the don't and the don't. <laughs> or the do and the do. Well, this is where you think things out. Mm -hmm. It's not just you do and you don't. And I think that the idea of you think this thing through and make a judgment based on your understanding is more what God wants than you don't dare go into the movie because the angels will stop at the door. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's actually one of the two things I was told when I was hired as a pastor in 1993 in a certain conference, not this one. I was told, we can defend you on most everything except for two, and one of them was, don't go into a movie theater, which immediately in my warped mind, I thought of our favorite hymn, Anywhere with Jesus, I Can Safely Go, <laughs> and I added an extra phrase, except for the movie theater. <laughs> exactly. Yes, sir. You know, when I was growing up as a child, there was a prayer I used to pray at night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray to the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray to the Lord my soul to take. And when I would pray that, I'd think, you know, God, I don't really want to die. So if you just, uh, you know, keep me alive. But it was one of those things that... I don't know that that prayer was really what my heart was saying as a little kid. Yeah. I understand the concept, mm -hmm. but as a child, I think that brings into this thinking that, will God just really, is this my way of saying to God, go ahead, God, take me? Yeah, a absolutely. And what, what I hear in that as well is something I wrestled with growing up. We used the, the good old King James, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. And I don't know about you, but I had a lot of fear. Because as a little kid, I may look pretty good, but you can ask my mom who's sitting here. I, I, was, I was a mess. She would now say no because, I mean, look at me now. I mean, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a problem with the truth. I had a problem with all kinds of things. So I lived as a little kid in fear that there were those things that I did not ask specifically for forgiveness for. And because of that, I was lost. So I lived in fear. I did not live in the love of God. I lived with the fear of God. And I didn't understand until just recent years that using the fear of God meant respect, not fear of scare. Yeah. But fear yeah. means respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. And that's one of the things that we do in the Bible Lab here is we take the original language and we try to figure out how is that most commonly used in that day? Like when the people read it or heard it, uh, what did that mean to them? Because that's what we want to know. Not how has language changed and now it means something different today. Because you can read through the Bible and it says, our God is an awful God. 
<laughs> Put that in front of your church. It means, now we say our God is an awesome God. And so language absolutely changes. Exactly. Well, there was a time in our church where there was a movement of perfectionism. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I learned from my mother that my grandparents were part of that movement and were kicked out of their local church. But they just kept on coming, so finally I let them back in. <laughs> <laughs> kept on paying their tithe and coming in a year or two later. Well, you know, you're here anyway. I guess we'll let you back. Yeah. But... Um, and can you address, there's some statements of Ellen White, I haven't really studied this, but there are some things that she said that have been maybe construed of having to stand on your own, you know, through your perfection, through your perfection when, when God withdraws from this earth. And yeah. I think, yeah, I'm kind of curious about that. Yes, uh, several things, and I would love to, to go down that entire trail. That would take a lot of time, but what I will say is this. As I've had to wrestle with those very statements, in the same way that we take scripture, whereas you don't want to take one verse or one section and, and build all your theology on one either perspective or verse, you want to take the whole of scripture and say, what does the entire Bible say about this topic? And then I'm going to build the consistency of character and the consistency of thought of what does the Bible say about and then you fill in the blank. As you look at um, the life of Ellen White and all of the writings of Ellen White, she actually was very much against legalist perfectionism, which is saying, I become so good, I no, I no longer need the cross to pay for me. She speaks very much against that. In fact, um, as, she, as she tries to figure out how do I help balance things out you look at the General Conference of 1888, and that was the big topic. And she writes a letter and uh, pretty much upsets the apple cart, trying to help people understand it's not by works. You cannot perfect yourself. That's why we need a Savior. And so if you look at the whole of what she writes, uh, you get the big picture of her saying we are in desperate need of a loving Savior who can overlook our imperfection. The other thing I would like to say about it, I, uh, Chris Blake, great friend of mine, incredible author. He's the guy that started Insight Magazine. He uh, has a, a phrase that is my favorite. He says, I love the books that Ellen White wrote while she was alive a lot more than the one she wrote after she died. <laughs> so a lot of the people who will find things that are very biting and very mean, you read messages to young people and they're like, she hates young people. No, she loved them. She would have the joke of the day. She'd have a jar of cookies in her wagon. The kids ran to her because they loved her. And so you can get a much different perspective if you only take one or two phrases out of context. Now, in continuing on in looking at this, the question is, does the Bible show us in places, times when God actually forsakes people? Are there, are there examples in Scripture where God forsakes people? Just shout it out. What, what things are you thinking of? You're thinking of Saul. What else are you thinking of? The Israelites. What are you, what are, who else? The Antediluvians. By the way, you broke the rule, sir, but I'll let you stay because you're awesome. We don't use big words here for two reasons. They don't understand it, but most importantly, I don't understand it. Antediluvians. We're talking about people that were lost in the flood. Somebody else said something else over here. Jesus on the cross. Ah, oh, and some people over here think, no, no, heresy. I love it. Go, go, go. But don't we have that text? Matthew 40, uh, 27, verse 45 and 46. Jesus hanging on the cross. He has to pull himself up for a breath. You know why people die on a cross, right? It's not the nails. Suffocation. Exactly. In order to breathe, you have to pull yourself up by the spikes. You have to push up from your feet that are spiked to the base of the cross. You have to pull up to get a little air in your lungs to say anything. So for Jesus Christ himself in that moment, that very dark moment, to spend not only the energy, but to endure the pain of getting air in his lungs. Whatever comes out of his mouth has to be absolutely of eternal consequence. So he pulls himself up. 
gets a little air. And then he says, as you can read on our study guide, Matthew 27, 45 and 46, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. Verse 46, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we all step back and we're like, okay. This is a son of God who lived a perfect life, a perfect example, completely connected with God the Father, and in his moment of greatest pain, in his moment of greatest need, he himself cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we automatically think in our mind, okay, if God would forsake his own son, surely He'll forsake me because he knows as well as I know. In fact, he knows better than I know what a wretched sinner I am. And so we all sing in our minds, my God, my God, why did I get cancer? What did I do? My God, my God, why why did my marriage just fall apart? My God, my God, why did my kid just die in such a horrific way. My God, my God, why am I bankrupt? It's obviously something that I did that was so bad that my sky turned dark. And about three in the afternoon, I'm sitting there realizing I'm living life without God. And it's because I've just gone too far. I represent sin. Now, let me ask you this. Get your comment and question cards ready because I want to ask you, what have you heard about this scene, about what God the Father was doing during this time? What was God the Father? What have you been told? Okay, It's very, very safe because I'm not saying this is what you're saying. I'm saying, what were you told that was going on between God the Father and God the Son during this time? I think maybe I'm missing it, but... I believe I've read, people misquote Ellen White, so I hope I'm not. But it seems to me I've read that she said that God was at the foot of the cross. Ah. Am I right? Uh. Yes. (laughs) And you're going to see that she was right too. But we're going to see pretty much what is the consistent thought, the majority thought of what's going on during this time. Yeah, I was thinking back to the, the book of Job, where Job, you know, went through all the bad things and felt forsaken, but he didn't know the, the back story behind it. And uh, in, in the case of relationships, when an accuser comes and says, your relationship is based on a false foundation, the only way to test it is to put through an untenable situation, which Hmm. is what happened, Hmm. to where, just like for Jesus or for Job, you go through an experience feeling like this is unfair and I'm forsaken all the way through it. But in fact, it's the greatest compliment that the other person in the relationship can offer you is to be able to say, I stand behind this person to the point that I can put them through this and I believe that they will come through it Yes, and the relationship will remain intact. Profound, profound. Yeah, Yeah, I love it. There's several things I I see there. Uh, Our perspective of Job, we've got to go through Job someday and very soon because it's foundational in understanding why bad things happen to good people and God's role in that. I I love the fact that you use the word compliment. Because I have a rule. The greatest compliment that God can give you is when you ask him for providence of this way or that way, should I, go, should I move to this town or move to that town? And God doesn't close one of the doors. It's God's greatest compliment in saying, I can use you anywhere. I'm, I trust you. I'm going to let you decide. It's God's greatest compliment. People get frustrated when God compliments them, by the way. It's the devil's greatest compliment when you go through trials. That's not God's compliment. 
Because even in the story of Job, thank you for bringing it up, you go right to Job chapter 1 and you see who is it who brought calamity to Job? Was it God? Was God trying to prove something? It's the devil trying to prove something in the book of Job. It all starts out by the devil making a claim and saying, I bet you he'll fall and let me prove it. And the bad things come into Job's life, not because God is trying to prove the heart of Job. What do we know about God? He knows your thoughts. There's nothing hidden within you. God knows everything about you. He doesn't have to test you. That's why in the Bible, 19 times with the exception of one, whenever the the Bible says God tests man's hearts, it's not testing to see whether you'll fall or stand. It's the word refine. It's the same word we use for making precious metals more precious. God's making you more precious. He, he already knows your heart. He already knows your limits. He doesn't need you to see your limits. He needs, he needs you to see your unlimitedness when you connect with him. So thank you. Very profound. Raul. I think that there's a difference between <clears throat> making a theological statement about what God does and who he is and expressing personal feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, the situation for Jesus was overwhelming more than we can imagine, ever imagine. And thanks God, we don't have to go through that. Um, Jesus was the son of God and was talking to his father, but he was dying as a man. He was dying there as a man and suffering pain. And he was expressing his feelings. That's my understanding anyway. Mm -hmm. He was expressing his his feelings. I can't bear this. Where Mm. are you, my father? Mm. In the case of Job, it's interesting the reaction of his wife. His wife said similar thing. You know, curse God and die and leave me alone. (laughs) And, you know, you don't have explanations for that. It's interesting that in the rest of the book, I mean, God does not reprimand Job's wife. And at the end of the trial, he blesses her tremendously. Yeah. And I, 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 for many years, I thought, is, is she, she's not making a theological statement. She is expressing her feelings of, I'm a mother, I lost all my children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of things about that. I'm going to get myself in trouble. So I'm going to go, go ahead and say I'm getting myself in trouble, <laughs> ladies. Okay. Number one, number one, this is okay. You can relax, ladies. Don't get on to me yet. This isn't God's test. So if the question is, why would God take everyone but leave the wife? This isn't God's test. It's Satan's test. Why would Satan leave the woman? (laughs) I'm not saying any woman. I'm saying a griping woman. Because it's the devil's test. And us men, we hang on your words, women. It looks like we're not listening, but we hang on your words. And when you start griping, you know what we try to do? We try to fix it. Okay, we're just, we, we got to fix it. You're unhappy, woman. I'm, it's my job as a husband to fix it so that you're happy. And so the devil leaves an unhappy wife so that Job will say, I will do anything to fix it. But Job's statement is, though he slay me, still I will not curse him. And so, don't hate me, ladies, because none of you are gripey. You're Bible lab participants, and you're all positive because you're, you're exemplifying the character of God and God is love. Uh, right here. Go ahead. Based on um, when I was a child being told, this is the only time in eternity between the father and the son separated mm-hmm. because the son was, became sin. And mm-hmm. the father was really despised sin, and that's the time the father despised him. Yeah, that's... and in fact, we, we have these sayings. Did you hear this? And the father whose eyes are too pure to look upon sin had to turn his back because Christ represented all sin. And God the father's eyes are too pure to look upon sin. Because God himself is the opposite of sin. And because Jesus bore all of our sins, it caused separation. Anybody been taught that? Good. Awesome. 
Next, over here. Yes, sir. I think to, as many times to understand these scriptures, you have to put yourself back in the time frame. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we can't just think of it from our time, it's from their time. So yes. to understand it. Yes. And we have to realize that the scribes, or whoever was writing these scriptures, um, they were people. They weren't God particularly, they were people hmm. that what they knew was the Old Testament. Their frame of reference was the Old Testament. Okay. And how we think of God in the Old Testament is kind of the, um, you know, fire and brimstone, you know, the tough God. Yeah. I think if a person really meditates to, to, I don't know how many people have done this, but try to put yourself in Jesus' place yeah. on the cross and see what he sees. Yeah. And, I mean, this is what I would say to the people looking out, because he's looking at all the people, you know, his disciples, his mother, and all the other people. He's seen, I would say the same thing, but if you move the, the commas and the periods and whatnot, I would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Looking out at the people. Mm -hmm. Because the scripture says that God never leaves us nor forsakes us. Yeah, it says more than 10 times in scripture that. Yeah. Those almost word for word every single time. So obviously something else is going on. I like what you said, and I especially like what you said at the beginning. We have to put ourselves in that place. What did it sound like to the people? You're a man ahead of your time. You're about three minutes ahead of your time, so don't get cocky. <laughs> but that's where we're going. What did the people hear? Because this was something profound that when Jesus said it, it meant something to them that we completely missed today. Fat. I wonder how many people older than me or younger than me ever had the experience of getting a shot and having a parent pinch you or something to distract you from the shot. I suggest in that moment that we can get into what Jesus was experiencing because all else ceases to exist. And when I say, why have you forsaken me? I may be focused on the pain that is being caused, but not actually seeing that God is right there. Yeah. And that happens over and over. I cried this morning, literally, because of a friend that has been so disenfranchised from church. Mm -hmm. And I had him excited about the Bible lab and we, just talking about Job right now, said it wasn't God, it was Satan. But then when we talk about it, we go back to, why would God allow that? Mm -hmm. that's but it why was we need Satan to to all along, and yeah. that's what we do over and yeah. over yeah. again. We get obscured to the fact that we're conveying something that never happened. Yeah. God was right there love wrapped around Jesus, the darkness fell, and yeah. Jesus is like, where are you, God? But if you've been with a loved one when they pass on, they aren't focused on, Pastor Roy is holding my hand, bless you for doing that, or praying for me. They're away from you because they are in that moment of transition. Yeah. Thank you. And once again, Thad, you're proving we need to go through the book of Job because there's a great misunderstanding about the character of God based upon this interaction. And when we actually use proper exegesis and walk through that, see what the language is saying, what the culture, what the context, everything about it is saying, it's gotten lost in translation. And so we're going to get it. Betsy. A few Sabbaths ago when you were talking about how the devil will get to somebody mm -hmm. and it's through their children. And so when Jesus died on the cross, the devil was getting to God the Father through hmm. Jesus. And when God had to pull away, his heart was so broken. Hmm. And it just gives a whole different perspective on God our Father. He loves us so much yeah. that he allowed Jesus to die. Hmm. But when all that was happening, it wasn't that he was forsaking him and just saying, you're done. Yeah. I mean, you're out of my life. He was, yeah. His heart was breaking even more. Yes. I, I love that you show the, the emotion of God. I'm going to give you something today that's going to absolutely change that picture for the positive. You'll be able to keep a lot of it. But when you see one thing that we all miss, it's going to, it's going to take away the one element 
that we all don't understand. How could a parent, for any amount of time, pull away from their child during their greatest time of need? I want you to pull out your yes and no cards, because this is a serious question. Yes and no cards. Get them out. No maybes on this one, all right? Yes and no only. Because here's my question. If your child was going through a time of great suffering, they call you up, mom, dad, I'm really hurting, can you come? Those of you that don't have kids yet, you got to pretend, okay? Think about your children of the future. They call you up, and let me just tell you, once you have kids, the feeling you have now is magnified about a million times. I was not really a baby person, like, oh, thanks for letting me hold your kid. Um, <laughs> They're kind of oozing some stuff. You can have them back. Um, once you have your own kids, it's like, I don't care. You just, you would do anything for those kids, right, parents? Yeah. So let me ask you this. If your child was going through a time of great suffering, yes or no, they call you on the phone and they say, I need you to come. Regardless of what's happened in the past, let's even say you've had a bad relationship. They call you on the phone and they say, I, I really need you. I'm, I'm in deep pain. Can you come? How many of you, be careful with your yes and no cards here, how many of you would not respond to your child and you would turn your back on them? Yes and no. Raise up your yes or no card. Would you turn your back on them and not show up? I'm seeing a sea of orange and Greg, you're making me worried. I see yes and no. You don't have kids. <laughs> I'm kidding with you. So every single one of you here said, if my kid called me up during their greatest moment of pain and said, I need you to come, you said, I'm there. I would not forsake my own child during their time of greatest pain. So let me ask you this question, yes or no. You ready? Are you a better parent than God? It's a sea of no's. Why would you think that God would pull away and forsake his only son when you never would your own? You see, these, these are the areas when we come to these moments of theology where it doesn't make sense, where it's heresy to say you're a better parent than God, isn't it? So why are we saying we're better parents than God? That God would at any time pull away from his own child? I'll tell you exactly why. It's because of misunderstood lyrics. You ever misunderstand lyrics? Don't you like driving in your car? You're singing at the top of your lungs and the person hits you and said, what did you just say? That's, that's not what the song says. I had this woman come up to me and she was cracking up laughing. It was after I'd preached... Uh, at a camp meeting, she comes up, she says, um, my child came up to me yesterday and was singing, a zombie, a zombie, Jesus wants me for a zombie. <laughs> I told her, well, that's kind of how we sing it. <laughs> Misunderstood lyrics are hilarious until you misunderstand these. Do you realize Jesus never said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you realize he never said that? And before you, I heard the lady right here, what? <laughs> sit down, lady, sit down. Don't leave. Jesus never said that because Jesus sang that. Jesus was singing a song with all the pain that it required to pull up to get enough air in his lungs. Jesus, in his rich voice, dry and cracking in the desert air, pulls himself up and begins singing, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I want you to look in your Bibles. Right there next to verse 46 in Matthew 27, you might see a superscript. Does anybody see a superscript Next to, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Anybody see it? Just raise your hand. You're still looking for it? There is. And it leads you to another place in Scripture. Where does it lead you to? Psalm 22, verse 1. Okay. Psalm 22, verse 1. 
If you turn over your worksheet, study guide here, I have it for you here. We're going to look at verses 7 through 18 first. But verse 1 of Psalm 22, it was in their hymn books. Everyone knew this song. So just like you said back here, the people who heard Jesus say those words, it meant something different to them than it means to us today. Because as we hear Jesus saying for that moment, the reason why the sky got dark and the reason why Jesus said what he did is because God himself removed himself from his son's presence at his greatest time of need. But that's not what the people heard who were standing around the cross because they heard the first line to a very famous hymn in their hymn book. Now, it wasn't as famous as hymn number 23, which was everyone's favorite, The Lord is My Shepherd. We sing that every Sabbath. But hymn 22, that was reserved for special times. It's a little bit more depressing. It's during a time of David's blues period, which is like saying every other day for the manic depressant songwriter. Um, Have you read through the Psalms? Every other psalm says, we, uh, we, uh, way to go, God. Where'd you go, God? Every other psalm. Psalm 22 is a blues song because uh, it's not about something like real exciting. It starts out with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If I were to say, would you be free from your burden of sin, you would immediately think, How did that happen? You just said there's power in the blood, all of you, without rehearsal. It's because your brain continues the song. Jesus pulls himself up, begins singing the song, and as the people are singing the song around the cross in their mind, the the, the tune is playing, and as they're singing the song, they get to verse 7. I want you to look at it with me. Verse 7, all who see me mock me, they hurl insults shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And at that moment, there are people yelling insults up at Jesus and saying, oh, if you really are who you say, if you really are the Son of the Cross, why don't you just come down from the cross? And as the song continues in their head, verse 9, yet you brought me out of the womb. And many of them were saying, well, they were saying it wasn't the Messiah because... He's the illegitimate son of Mary and Joseph. And he made me trust you even at my mother's breast. I am poured out like water. What happens when the spear goes up into Jesus' side? And all my bones are out of joint. One of the things that happens because you're pulling yourself up to get more air is after a while, it just pulls out of the socket. They're seeing this happen right before their own eyes. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a pot shard. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. About that time, Jesus is trying to say something. They say, he's thirsty, and they run and get him vinegar and a sponge and lift it up while the song is still going in people's minds. Verse 16, dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Let me ask you a question. Who wrote this song? We say David, but let me ask you this question. When did any of these things ever happen to David? When did they divide his clothing? When, was, when did they pierce his hands and his feet? When did any of this happen to David? You're right, on the 3rd of November. It never happened. Never happened to David, which tells you one thing. We know David's a shepherd. We know David's a king. We know he's a fugitive. We know he's a songwriter. We know he's a poet. But do we also know he's a prophet? David didn't write these words, which tells me something even more bizarre. God himself wrote these words. The greatest songwriter of all universes, wrote this song himself, wrote these lyrics, and inspired them to David to be placed to music, to be 
sung for generations until at the right moment, the song lyrics would be so ingrained in the minds of people that when Jesus pulls himself up and begins the first line, the people continue the song. God himself wrote the song, inspired the song, so that when he came as man, he could sing the song. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if we stop here, we have a very incomplete picture of the character of God. Because we still think that in this moment, God the Father would forsake the Son. I'm very thankful that we have a second verse to this song. We're only halfway through Psalm 21. We're only through the first verse. Thank God there's more information. Thank God there's a bigger picture. I love the old commercial uh, where you see the, the, the woman and she's in her car and then all of a sudden this really gruff man, he comes, he rips open the door and he starts yanking the woman out of the car and we're like, oh no, this poor woman, this defensive woman. And then the camera starts backing up and, and you realize the car's on fire and the man is actually saving the woman from the car on fire. About that time, the narrator comes on, you need the bigger picture. Channel 10 News has the bigger picture. <laughs> we need the bigger picture here. And so I'm very thankful that the song, the song does not stop here. It continues. Because look what happens in the second half of the song. In verses 19 through 31, let's look at verse 19. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Verse 24, for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Is this a different picture? He's right there. The first half of the song says, this is what you people can see around the cross. Second half of the song says, here's something you can never see because it's in the mind of God. First half is what's happening on the outside. Second half is what's happening on the inside. Let's see what happens in verse 25. From you, Jesus talking to God, comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. God made a vow. He's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? Why? Because that's who he is. God is love, and they made a vow. No price is too high for you. There is no pain that's too much for you. There is nothing that is too far for God to save you. He goes on, Verse 26, the poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. This is the thing that's helping Jesus on the cross saying, it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. Next says, may your hearts live forever. Verse 27, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. He's thinking beyond Israel, beyond Calvary. He's thinking about us around the world. In fact, we're right here. In uh, verse 30, posterity will serve him, future generations will be told about the Lord. That's us here. And Jesus pulls himself up one last time to get just a little bit of breath because he wants to help the people sing the very last phrase of the song. He pulls himself up, and as the words of the song are rolling through the people's minds, Verse 31, they will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. Jesus lets out the words, it is finished, while the people say, he has done it. It's the same song. Jesus never was saying he was separate from God at that time. He wrote the song. He's telling you what's going on on the inside that all of us are misinterpreting because we think God is such a just God that we have to exact payment. When at that very moment that we're saying God needed that payment, Christ is paying it. You're paid for. Live like you're paid for. You don't live in fear. We don't have to live in fear anymore. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. 
there's still some people that look at this and say, yeah, but isn't there times in Scripture where God forsakes people? Isn't that kind of universalist to say that everyone's saved? Yes, it is universalist to say that, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you can't be lost. I'm just saying God doesn't lose you. You decide to tell God to get lost. We can look in Scripture in Judges chapter 16, verses 18 to 21, when the Lord departed from Samson, when he stepped away from his divine calling. Did God step away from Samson, or did Samson step away from God? Judges 10, God said that he would no longer deliver Israel because they had turned to other gods. Is this God stepping away from Israel, or Israel stepping away from God? Israel's choosing to do things their own way. They're leaving uh, Yahweh, who they see as the God of crisis, to go toward Baal and all the gods of everyday life. And then we see in Matthew 5.14, where Jesus told uh, the, the pastors of the day, Jesus said, let the Pharisees alone, because they're blind leading the blind. Just, just let them go. Let them walk off the cliff. So what's the big picture? I love 2 Timothy 2, verses 11 to 13. Would someone please look that up for us? I want you to read it for us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13 sums up everything about whether God forsakes you or does not forsake you. Who would be willing to read that for us? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. 2 Timothy 2, 11. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Stop. It was good news till he read that, right? If we endure, he endures with that. It's all this. We're, we're all together. If you deny him, he's going to deny you. Oh, God will forsake you. But then read verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Even if you are faithless, he has to remain faithful. Why? It's in his character. He cannot change his spots. It's who he is. He can't change it. I'm going to be faithful to you always. You can deny me. You can walk away from me. You can walk away from salvation. It's your choice. But God's choice is all, always, always, always faithfulness. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. It's just in his nature. Once again, when you let the Bible speak for itself about the character of God, who knew that Jesus was never saying that God had forsaken him? Jesus was actually singing. Who knew Jesus could sing? The surprises just keep coming, and this conversation by far was one of the most revolutionary conversations we've had in rewriting the story in the way that it actually happened. And wow, did that change our concept of God the Father and how much he sacrificed while his son was being tortured on the cross. I'm here with our friend Stu, Pastor Stu Hardy, pastor for media at Loma Linda University Church. And Stu, I'm telling you, that conversation was transformational in that story. I, I'll never see that story the same way again. Well, that's the thing. I, I think it's, it's so incredible with the, with the Bible, and it, it's one of the things that evidences for me where the Holy Spirit was really involved in that, where something that happened here, there, and when you read on the surface, oh, it seems like a simple story, and then there's always these layers that open and peel back and reveal more and more things about God. Absolutely. We want you to have these same conversations in your community, and if you would like to either start a Bible lab where you live or see if there might already be a Bible lab within driving distance, make sure you go to our website, thebiblelab.com, and see what's happening in your area. If there's not a Bible lab in your area, please go to the contact page, send me a message. I'm going to send you a bunch of info, and I'm also going to talk with you personally and help you along the way to start this type of conversation in the community that you live, because the people around you are absolutely desperate 
to learn about the true nature of God. And as we're going through this pilot series, it's amazing every single week as we open up scripture and see what it really says about the character of God, there are endless surprises because our God is an infinite God with infinite love. So if you're feeling inspired to have a Bible lab in your community, make sure you contact me on our website. Now, this video would not be coming to you if it wasn't for some incredible support that we've received from Stu and his team. Stu, what does it take to get one of these episodes out to the people and how can the people out there make sure that it continues if this is what they want to see more of? Well, kind of what we do is, is kind of like if you're watching uh, sports, you know, you see an athlete, they look, it looks like it's so simple. But in actual fact, there's a lot of planning, there's a lot of technology, you know, sound can go bad, cameras and stuff, and it's very expensive. And we use a lot of volunteers, but we also have to use some, some people that are paid and professional that, you know, to ensure that we get the recording there and, and all that kind of stuff. So it takes a lot of resources, both in people and equipment. And our priority, like we say all the time, is first and foremost, we want people to have access. And this is such an important thing. We're so glad to be part of this because anytime we can get people actually talking about the Bible and not just sitting. Now, if you can, if you're in a position, you can support the media ministry. You can just go to our website, LLUC.org, and click on Give. And then there'll be another page. You click again, and you'll see something that you've seen in churches probably most of your life, and that's a little tithe envelope, and you'll see the word media. And you just type in the amount. It can be a one-time gift, or you can even set it up to where, especially for those of us that maybe aren't, don't have a lot of cash, every little bit counts, you can set it up to do $5 a week, $20 a week, or $5 a month, or $20 a month, the recurring giving. It's really simple. It's just right on a tithe envelope. You just put it in the media category, and that's what helps us keep bringing this ministry to you. That's right. We're not here to monetize the gospel. We just want to make sure the gospel is able to get to you, especially in video format. And Stu, that's exactly what I do. I give a little bit amount on a recurring basis. It automatically comes out. I don't have to worry about it. I do it once and it's done. And I've been amazed seeing how much my little bit goes with a lot of other people giving a little bit and how it's helping ministry happen so we don't have to stress out about exactly. that. Exactly, yeah. Now, I want to make sure that you come back for episode four because in that episode, I have a couple of surprises for you. First of all, we ask the question, why does God test us? If he knows everything, what is he trying to find out? And how does God test us? I'm taking you on a special excursion, a field trip of sorts, to a precious metals refinery, and you don't want to miss it. Thanks so much for coming on this journey with us, and I just pray for God to continue blessing you as you continue to research and develop the character of God. The University Church Media depends on a very diverse team of volunteers and a relatively small staff to bring the various worship services to you each and every week. Now this dedicated media crew is committed to producing not just a religious show, but a meaningful worship experience. It is very rewarding to review our viewership reports where we see literally thousands around the globe who are viewing the broadcast each and every week. Now, naturally, with anything that really matters in this life, there are challenges. The weekly broadcasting of the worship services is no exception. Now, one of our biggest challenges is raising enough financial resources to maintain this global ministry. This is where we humbly request your support, and we'd like to invite you to become part of the crew. Now, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars each year to produce the worship service broadcasts 
each and every week. And this is after the generous help of over 60 volunteers. Now, there are many of you who have been blessed with the financial resources where you continue to generously share large donations that help keep this ministry going. Now, there are also others that may not be able to give the large donation, but you steadily give what you can, which without your support as well, we simply would not be able to continue this ministry. Now, for all of you who have supported and continue to do so, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. It truly makes a difference. We regularly hear from people that due to a variety of circumstances, they depend on our weekly worship service broadcast. You make that possible. Now that we're well on our way into 2019, we have a very urgent request to our faithful donors, as well as to those who maybe haven't had the opportunity to donate to this ministry. The media crew has spent a considerable amount of time over the last few months discussing how we can make this media ministry even more effective. Now, during our conversations, we have identified some things we really need to do that would make the worship services more impactful. We have also discussed the incredible need to produce additional content targeting those that don't even attend any worship service anywhere. Now, we particularly identified a very urgent need to produce content to engage the youth and young adults. Many on the crew actually fit into this demographic and they know several who aren't really actively involved with any worship community. But we are also aware of that there are many parents and grandparents who are praying earnestly for their kids and grandkids to connect or to reconnect with Jesus. Now the University Church Media Crew is grateful for the ministry we are already participating in, but there's a strong conviction that we are called to do more. With this calling in mind, the crew would like to extend an invitation for you to become part of the team. Now this is regardless of your stage in life or where you live. Won't you become part of the media crew and support this ministry financially? Now naturally, we rely on those who generously donate larger sums, but we also depend on those that give what they can each and every month. Now with a strong sense of God's calling to urgently produce new content, the University Church Media Department is launching the Just Five campaign. You have the opportunity to become part of the media crew by making a commitment to donate just $5 a week. Now our initial goal is to receive a spirit-led commitment of just 3,000 individuals of the thousands of our global viewers to make this commitment of just $5 a week. Now for some of you that maybe can't afford that, we can do $5 every two weeks, or even just $5 a month. Any amount matters. We feel a very urgent call and need to produce more content and to expand this ministry. We could really use your support, and we ask you to join the media crew here at the Loma Linda University Church. So go to our website, louc.org, and click on the media, and you can find out more information how you can become part of the media crew.